This is On the Other Hand. podcast sponsored by Braver Angels in Arkansas that explores politics and other issues of importance to Arkansans through conversations with community leaders. Stay with us as we talk to another leader in Arkansas who works across differences to get things done and to bring us closer together. Hello and welcome to On the Other Hand. I'm your host, Glenn White. I'm here with my co-host, April Chatham Carpenter. So I hope you're ready for today's conversation with a community leader in Arkansas who helps work Word Solutions. So April, uh, how about it? Who do we talk to today? Glenn, I'm really excited to have one of my colleagues at the University of Arkansas, Little Rock, joining us, uh, Dr. Rebecca Glacier. I've known Rebecca for, uh, I guess, ever since really I came into UALR in, in 2015. And Rebecca's a professor of political science here, and she's an active teacher and scholar. Uh, she directs so many different things uh, in the communities, and one of the reasons why I wanted to invite her on the show is because of her work with the Little Rock Congregation Study, which we'll get to be talking about, and that's a community-based, long, long-term long research project, and in addition, she's a political scientist and has published over 30 peer-reviewed journal articles in the field of religion and politics and political communication, as well as online teaching. I know my own online teaching has, has gotten better because of her work on online classroom rapport. So welcome, Rebecca, to our podcast. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Yeah. So Rebecca, we kind of usually start these out by talking a little bit about what you're up to these days. I know you just got back from a study abroad trip to Spain with, with students, and uh, you also worked, I think, last semester, where I saw some good press releases about your work with the Model Arab League on campus. So what are you working on these days related to political communication in particular? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, working with students is close to my heart and I love doing it. And um, we just got back from Spain and it's always such a joy to get to travel with students and to take them to new places and to help them see the world through new perspectives. So that's something that brings me a lot of joy for sure. In terms of political communication, one thing that I'm working on right now is a project with my research team through the Little Rock Congregation Study. We just did uh, an event in the community where we brought a bunch of people together from the community from all diverse perspectives and walks of life. And we paired them up one-on-one to have conversations about important community issues. And they were together with their partner, their conversation partner for about an hour. And they talked a little bit about their own background. And then we had these prompts where they would talk about issues in the community and their own perspectives on them. And because I'm a political scientist, a social scientist, uh, we had constructed this as an experiment. So some of the pairs, people shared a religious background, and in some of the pairs, they shared a racial background, and in some of the pairs, they didn't have anything in common at all. So right now, my research team is looking through that data to see if having those commonalities affected the outcomes of these conversations or how people felt in having the conversations. I will talk more about that study a little bit, but I'm just curious real quick. Have you found any initial findings that uh, have surprised you? Well, one thing which we found right away, which I'm excited about, but also, you know, as a social scientist, a little concerned about as we do further data, data analysis is that the response was overwhelmingly positive. People loved having these one-on-one conversations. And that is fantastic news that They really enjoyed talking with their conversation partner. Um, We asked them about what the experience was like overall. And it was almost to a person that they had, they were maxing out how positive the experience was. But as a social scientist, I would like a little variability in my outcome so that I can see what's making a difference and how people are responding. Um, We did do some follow-up interviews. So we're hoping to get some qualitative data to understand more deeply the people who maybe were talking with someone from the similar racial background or similar religious background, if that mattered to them in the conversation and if that changed the things that they disclosed or the things that they talked about or how they felt in that conversation. So that should give us a little bit deeper understanding than just the statistics. But in terms of the statistics, people had an overwhelmingly positive experience 
talking one-on-one with their conversation partners. Well, that's interesting. And, and we'll, again, probably get more into what causes us to avoid maybe talking to each other across the political aisle later in the interview. Uh, but I think when we do sometimes talk to people, we realize it's not as it's not as scary as we thought, uh, maybe perhaps initially, uh, you know, but so I ask you, I'm going to ask one general question and then we'll get into kind of more of a range of questions about your, your work with the Little Rock Congregation Study and other things as well. But what do you think um, produces that expectation of friction between people and groups who differ politically? What, what kinds of things precipitate that friction? Yeah, this is such a big question. And as a political scientist, it is one that I have thought a lot about. And I think that it comes down to something that is sometimes just innate in us as human beings. And this is the tendency we have to create in groups and out groups. So in political science, uh, in, in sociology, sometimes we talk about this as social identity theory. But a lot of times we try to look at our group, people who are like us as our in-group, and then people who are not like us as an out-group. And we try to give positive attributes to people who are in our in-group and negative attributes to people who are in our out-group. And for a variety of reasons, political identity, what political party we affiliate with has become more and more important to how we see ourselves as people. And so the people who are in our out group, politically, we tend to give all kinds of negative associations to. We can't just see them as well-meaning, intelligent people who happen to share, have different political views than us. Instead, we see them as people who are fundamentally wrong and bad people. Um, And that is really troublesome. And I think that one of the problems is that all of our in-groups tend to overlap. So more and more we're becoming siloed so that our political in-group, all the people who share political views is one in-group, but all of our church in-group overlaps with our political in-group. And our neighborhood in-group is also the same as our political in-group. And our softball team in-group is also the same as our political in-group. So if we don't have any cross-cutting cleavages, as we would talk about in political science, if we don't cross cut those in groups, if we don't see people from different political groups in our you know, education in group or our friend in group or our church in group, then we're gonna think that everyone outside of our political in group is bad. But if we come into contact with people from a different political viewpoint in one of our other in groups, like our bowling league in group, then we have a chance to see the other side as potentially good, well-meaning people. But we're having fewer and fewer opportunities to come into contact with people from our political outgroups. Thus, your dialogue groups that you just had provided some of those opportunities. Exactly. That's what I was thinking too. So Rebecca, in our podcast, we try to talk to community leaders, as, as you heard, who are in some way trying to reach across various divides in their society and, and with an intent, hopefully, of working toward the common good. So I understand that you've had some uh, chances to do some work like that, uh, working with people who differ from you politically in other ways. And uh, the thing I've heard you know, April talk about is the Little Rock Congregation Study. And I wonder if you could kind of share with us a little bit about that uh, project, what it's about, kind of give us a little details that relates to the topic for today. Yeah, thank you so much for asking. The Little Rock Congregation Study is close to my heart, so I am always happy to talk about it. It is a research project that I founded in 2012, and our goals began with, um, as a as a teacher and a professor, I wanted to get my students out of the classroom and into the community to have some, some high-impact learning experiences, and we also wanted to learn a little bit about the impact of community engagement by places of worship. So what was going on by Little Rock is a is a very religious city. We're here in the Bible Belt in the South, and there's all kinds of places of worship all around our city who are doing good work and are engaging and helping people. And sometimes they're doing that work 
all on their own and not working together. And sometimes we don't even know the good work that they're doing. And so we wanted to find out about that. Uh, and I wanted the students to get out there and to learn about that. And and for the students to have these kind of eye-opening experiences for you know a student who was raised going to Black Protestant churches to attend a Jewish synagogue or for a student who is an avowed atheist to go to an evangelical church and to get to see these people who maybe are they had previously considered in their out group and to get to know them and to get to see what they're up to. And then the final goal of our, our research project is to return meaningful findings and deliverables back to the community. So we don't just want to study our community, but we want to have our community really be partners with us in this research. So we talk with them and ask them about what they want us to be studying. And we try to give reports and host summits and return findings that will be really meaningful and, and valuable to them. And it's been just uh, the joy of my career to be able to direct the study and to be able to work in the community here in Little Rock. So if I understand correctly, you're actually asking before you start, uh, you ask the congregations, okay, what would you like to know about yourselves and the work that you're doing so that we can maybe collect some data on that? Is that kind of the idea? And then you use that to determine, you know, what kind of specific studies you're doing in each congregation? Yeah, and we've learned and gotten better over the years. We have a clergy advisory board that helps us select questions. Um, we hosted a summit before our last big data collection. We do a big data collection every four years on election year. <laughs> so on a presidential election year. So uh, in 2019, we held a big, big summit of religious leaders in Little Rock and we invited them to come and to tell us what are the biggest issues in the community that you want us to ask about and that you want us to find out about. And then we do surveys of the congregation members and then every participating congregation gets a personalized report about their congregation members, what they care about, how they're doing spiritually, what issues in the community matter to them what they want to volunteer on, what they want to see their congregation get involved in, so that it's really a valuable resource for the leaders of that congregation. But then the questions that we ask, because, you know, as a social scientist, I would put together a 20-page survey and I'd ask questions all day, but people don't have time for that. So we have to be very selective in the questions that we ask. And in 2019, our clergy actually urged us to ask more questions about race. And we were really glad that we did because we had a bunch of really valuable findings uh, in 2020 when suddenly all of our congregations were talking about race and wanting to know what they could do to get more engaged on the issue of race. Well, I'd like to know more about what you learned from that. I, now, you mentioned about some things specific to race, so maybe if you could cover that, and then I'd also at some point like to hear anything you may have learned about different faith backgrounds and any findings there as well. Yeah, the findings on race we thought were really fascinating. So we asked about a number of community issues, about 10 different community issues, and asked people to um, tell us how important this issue was to them. And the number one issue in Little Rock was education. Uh, people said this is the a number one issue. Healthcare was also there at the top. Race relations was the fourth most important issue in Little Rock. But then we asked a follow-up question, and we said, um, would you like your congregation to get involved in helping to address this issue in the city? And the number one issue that people wanted their congregation to get involved in was race. Wow. And we think that is a really important finding because when it comes to an issue like crime, which people thought was an important issue or an issue like healthcare, which was right near the top of the list for issues that people think are important, those are issues that matter to people but they don't see them as issues that their place of worship should be getting involved in doing something about. But when it comes to racial justice and racial reconciliation issues, that's where they wanna see their place of worship getting involved. Um, and so we think that um, places of worship and religion in general has a lot of tools that can help address the harm that has been done on the issue of race and specifically the harm that's been done by religious institutions and religious traditions in the past with tools of repentance and forgiveness and healing that can come from religion. And people want 
the safe space that comes from a place of worship and from the guidance from their religious leader to be able to talk about race. A lot of people are uncomfortable talking about race and doing so in a place of worship where they feel like they might be given a little bit of grace makes it a place where they feel like they can. And so that's why our, our research team has put together a resource packet that's freely available online that contains models for how you can do faith-based racial justice efforts, resources, frequently asked questions, uh, startup guides, all kinds of things that are freely available for any kind of congregation that wants to get engaged in this work. And we held a summit in the fall of 2022 that and invited leaders to come and learn about this work, hear our findings, hear from other faith leaders in Little Rock who think that race is an important religious issue um, and take these resources with them and use them in their congregations in the way that they feel is most helpful. So the, the data, I guess, is still coming on board and trying to make sense of that is, is not something you've gotten to yet in terms of understanding their motivation for studying race and being able to talk about race. Is that the case? We have done interviews with uh, two dozen clergy leaders in Little Rock, and they've told us about their what their efforts are in um, engaging in racial justice work. And so we do have data on that, and we have a, a paper that's recently received a revise and resubmit invitation uh, that we're working on revising right now that shows there are different motivations for Black and white congregations in engaging in race, um, that Black congregations have been doing it all along. And they're tired of trying to lead white congregations and that white congregations are, um, black congregations are using scripture in a more uh, deep way to engage with the issue of race and white congregations really are doing a lot of different kinds of programs, but are not engaging with black congregations and partnerships as much. So we do have some findings from those interviews that we're getting ready to publish. And then we also have um, follow-up in, uh, interviews and surveys from the clergy leaders who attended the summit, where we asked them about the things that they're doing following the summit. So we know that the resources that we put out into the community are leading to action. And so we have over 50 different commitments and actions that have taken place from the people who attended the summit following hearing from those leaders and receiving our resource packet. So we know that action is happening as a result of our research being shared out in the community. Do you have any uh, specific stories that you might be able to share with us in terms of what people have reported about the impact and influence of going through this, either from the standpoint of the congregations and their leaders, or even from your students who are doing that work? Yeah, thank you so much for asking. Um, one thing I know uh, from a, a white clergy leader had told me after this event that he had been serving in Little Rock for I think about seven or eight years. And he said that he hadn't been able to connect with any black clergy in a meaningful way. But following our summit where we had had clergy leaders seated at tables of four and we had had some questions over lunch, they had talked with one another and about race and had some questions on the table. Things like, what was the first time that you realized your own racial identity and what was that experience like for you? And so they were sharing personal experiences of race. And he said it was only through connecting with another Black clergy member over that lunch that I made my first real lasting friendship and connection with a black clergy member in this city. And so I was, I was really happy to hear that because even if all that happened is that relationships were built, I think that is really meaningful. But we also heard about people who are now um, using a, a racial frame when they're talking about scriptures or choosing to say something about race in their sermons, not just on, you know, Martin Luther King Day or on Juneteenth, but bringing up race more often when they're talking in their sermons and people who have created um, committees at their churches to look at the racial history of their churches. 
So we've been excited to hear those kinds of stories about real, real action being taken by the clergy here in Little Rock. Yeah, so that's amazing. I, I had forgotten that you've been involved in that work since 2012. And that really one of the things that led you into that work uh, was to get your students out um, and get it, them out of their own comfort zone, kind of getting them to experience out groups as well. Um, do you have a story that you can remember from a student that crossed that religious divide and found change as a result? Yeah, I always love reading the student evaluation comments at the at the end of the semester. And the students, I think maybe because those are anonymous, maybe they feel a little more free to, to say their experiences. But they'll say something like, I had definitely never been to a Mormon congregation before, but the people were so welcoming. Or I really enjoyed the, the beauty of attending the Shabbat service at at the Jewish temple. And I'd never been to something like that. And it really opened my eyes to, to this, this community and how beautiful this community was. So hearing the, and sometimes students will say like, I had a really negative experience with religion growing up. But when I went to this service, the people were really kind and welcoming to me. And I can see how this is a positive thing for other people, even though it wasn't positive for me. Interesting. So they're willing already to be looking into embracing the idea of difference and being able to get out of their own silos and in groups. I think that's something that we all need to be doing. So thank you for bringing that up as kind of an example of, of what you do. Well, I know that you're a professor and uh, you obviously are in the political science area. And I'm, I'm curious, I've actually never, even though I've known you, I've never asked you about this uh, your journey that led you to becoming a professor and and getting interested in politics in the first place. What what kinds of experiences led you into this particular part of your life? Oh, thanks so much for asking. You know, I when I went to college, I took a class on international relations, and that's where I fell in love with political science and just the there's such a big world out there. And I just wanted to know more about how countries are interacting with each other and why do they go to war and what leads to agreements and how does peace happen? Um, and that those were the big questions about international politics that I really got excited about. Um, and uh, no one in my family has a college degree, so I didn't really know anything about graduate school. I literally had a professor say to me, have you thought about graduate school? And I said, what's graduate school? <laughs> <laughs> and when they explained it to me, I was so excited. I said, you mean I can keep going to school? <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> um, so I, I started my PhD and um, my I am consider myself a person of faith also, uh, which is not that common among political scientists. And so when I started looking for a research question to do my dissertation on, religion came naturally to my mind. Um, and I found it very interesting that I was discouraged from studying religion in a political science context. But a lot of people said religion doesn't matter for politics or religion is just what people say they're doing when really it's about material interests. Um, and I I didn't believe that. I said from from my experience and from a lot of people I know, their religion really sincerely influences the decisions that they make in many places in their lives, including the way that they um, think about politics and think about the, the choices in their lives every day. And so um, that's what I uh, decided to study. And actually the work that I partially built my dissertation on was about um, religion's influence on foreign policy decision making, and then I did some work on international uh, peacemakers, how people are motivated to to work in in protracted conflicts internationally and by religion to try to bring peace to those conflicts. Uh, and then here in Little Rock, what I was thinking in part as I as I sent students out into the in the world to meet these congregations was 
there are people doing peacemaking work right here in our own city. And we might not think of it in the same way as people who are doing peacemaking work in international conflicts, but they are trying to bring peace to our community um, by addressing hunger, by addressing homelessness, by helping children in need. Um, and they're motivated by their faith as well. And let's try to understand better what's happening here because it has political implications. Interesting. And I know you and I have not ever had this conversation about religion and politics, but so much of media coverage, especially on the conservative side of things, has, I think, really looked at the connection of religion and politics in a negative way. Uh, more recently, perhaps, as the nationalism, Christian nationalism kind of has been a uh, a term that's been used. Um, but you're talking about the positive impact of religion on politics uh, and, and how we can work in the peacemaking and, and helping other people. Uh, and so I'm, I, I, find that, I find that interesting and, and engaging. How do you see religion and politics working together uh, in, our, in our nation and state um, as you've been doing this continued research from your dissertation all the way to the local level? Yeah, there's this important concept in religion and politics called the ambivalence of the sacred that Scott Appleby, a researcher, um, popularized. And what the ambivalence of the sacred means and how I use it in my research is that religion can go either way. It Sometimes religion can be used to motivate suicide bombers, and sometimes religion can be used to motivate people who are, you know, selflessly um, out giving their lives to help bring peace to a protracted conflict. And the same religious tradition, the same, you know, literally the same verse of a holy text can lead someone, can lead two different people down those two different paths, right? So religion is, sacred things have ambivalence to them. And so I think religion goes both ways and it goes both ways in religion and politics today. I think that there, there are ways that religion is, is manipulated and, and used in negative ways. I think there are clearly ways that um, religion has, has led to division and to racism and to oppression. And I think that there are ways that religion can lead to healing and to unity and to, to positive outcomes in our communities. In my research, so I, I uh, am finishing a book right now called Faith and Community, which is about how religion can help individuals and places of worship and society. But when the congregations get engaged in the community, when they're out there working in the communities, like the congregations that I've been talking about in Little Rock, that that can have so many positive outcomes. So I think that we need to talk more about the positive ways that religion can help society for a number of reasons. And one is because when we are focusing only on the negative, that's what we're focusing on. And two is because we need to hear more of these positive stories and to give a model for how religion can be doing those good things so that people who see religion as their outgroup, people who are not religious, see still the positive ways that religion could benefit society, even if they themselves are not religious. I love that. So the ambivalence, I, I like that content, uh, ambivalence of the sacred, sounds like a, a lot of uh, societal tools that are powerful that can uh, be used for the good or the bad, right? And, and I, is that kind of ca capturing part of that concept? Yeah, I mean, the internet is the same way, right? The ambivalence yeah. of the internet, it can, it can be used for good or ill. <laughs> yeah. So how do you, you know, like when you work, I, I don't know how your classroom is conducted and how you do things there, but maybe you've spoken a little bit on this, but how do you encourage the expression of ideological diversity in your own classroom or uh, whether it be, you know, political or, you know, allowing people of faith to speak up and feel welcome. How, how do you do that and manage that process among your students and in your classroom? Yeah, that's such an important thing to foster because I believe that uh, diversity is a good in and of itself in, in my classroom and, and in society. And, and I want and need that 
ideological diversity in my classroom. So I, I need all of my students to feel welcome and like they can contribute because the goals in my classroom are for students to learn <laughs> and for us to have respectful political discussion. So those political differences are absolutely essential. So the students aren't gonna learn if the only thing that happens is that I tell them facts. They need to be able to talk about things. They need to hear different perspectives. They need to talk through ideas uh, because there's not one right answer. And so for in order for them to uh, express, I tried to model the expression of multiple viewpoints. So I never stick to just one viewpoint in the classroom. I'll, I'll give multiple viewpoints on, on issues on different days. And I also try to validate multiple viewpoints. So um, I, do, I never say things like, I think this, I'll always say, well, some people might, might see it this way um, and presenting different viewpoints. And then I try to validate what students say by saying things like, John makes an interesting point. What about X to try to push the conversation forward and engage more students? Um, even if I don't agree personally with what students are saying, I try to validate what they're saying as a contribution that is worth hearing so that students feel like they have the space to continue to contribute. You know, in Braver Angels, we one of the things we do is we teach skills, communication and conflict resolution skills that can help people have these kinds of conversations in a way that maintains some degree of decorum and respect. Uh, I, I wonder, it sounds like you're modeling that. Do you do any specific things to uh, encourage or teach how to go about having those difficult conversations other than just modeling it? Uh, um, and, and then if things maybe go bad, you know, when things, uh, you know, people have different opinions and it gets a little bit tense, you know, how would you respond to that? Yeah, so in recent years, I haven't always done this, but in recent years, um, I've, I've talked with my classes about the fact that we're going to sometimes have difficult conversations in our class and we'll come up with a, a silly word at the beginning of class for when that anyone can call out for if they feel like the discussion is getting a little off the rails or a little heated. So we'll call it like our class safe word. So, you know, maybe we'll use pineapple and anyone in the class can say, can just go pineapple if they feel like this is, this is too much, we need to take a pause. Things have gotten a little, a little intense. And so we'll talk about, you know, what the rules are that you, you know, let people finish speaking. We don't, we don't cut people off. We're respectful. We don't use personal insults. Everybody gets a turn. If you've already spoken, let's check and see if someone else wants to speak first. Um, and that you can always call pineapple if you feel like we're getting too intense. And then I also, because we're talking about politics a lot in my classes, I ask the students to not be partisan. So we talk about policy issues. What are the consequences of that policy? What might happen if we implement this policy? What has been the result of this policy? But I ask them not to say like this particular politician or this particular party sucks or has done a terrible thing or is awful. Um, instead, we'll talk about the policy and what has resulted because of policies, but not about specific people or parties. Well, thanks for joining us on today's edition of On the Other Hand, the first part of our conversation with Dr. Rebecca Glazier. Dr. Glazier mentioned the Little Rock Congregation Study website where you can find out some of the resources that she was talking about. And we want to give you the website address for that. We'll also be putting that in our program notes. And you can actually find that by going to this address, research.ualr dot edu slash lrcs which are the initials for little rock congregation study research dot ualr dot edu slash lrcs be sure to check out the second part of this conversation with rebecca as well as other podcast episodes of on the other hand you can find us on the podcast page of the braver angels arkansas website at arkansas.braverangels.org. 
or on many popular podcast sites. When you visit our website, you can help us improve our program by responding to a brief survey using the link on our podcast webpage. You can also email us for program or speaker ideas or other feedback at otherhandar at gmail.com. That's otherhandar at gmail.com. On the Other Hand is sponsored by Braver Angels in Arkansas. Music was composed by Randall Standridge of Jonesboro, Arkansas, and was performed by the University of Northern Colorado Symphonic Band, Dr. Richard Main, conductor. From your host, Glenn White. And April Chatham Carpenter. Let's each do our part to bring our community closer together. Closer together.